you're here, the men and women uh, who are going to receive our offering, if you would go ahead and come and take your places, and you can begin to receive that as soon as you arrive there. I know, again, that many of you who call our church home, you give online because it's convenient and consistent, uh, but if you came prepared to give today, you can place that in the basket uh, or bucket when it comes by, or if you have the Connect card, you can place that in there uh, as well. Just a couple of things to let you know about while we're receiving the offering this morning. Uh, At the first of each month, I like to give you a little update about where we are with our build project. And our build project is uh, uh, actually raising the dollars necessary to build our new home. And we moved in here in July. If you're new to our church, we met in the world's ugliest shopping center for almost 10 years. uh, And then as a family committed uh, to building a a permanent home for for our church. It really is a God story, and you can go back and listen to some of those things online and find out how that all came together. But uh, a bunch of core families came together and said, hey, we're going to commit to raising dollars outside our normal operating budget to build a home. And so our goal over three years was $2 million to raise uh, over that time. And then we'd finance the remaining amount with a goal to pay that off within 15 or 20 years uh, on a note. And so I like to each month come and just bring you a little update about where we are and how we're progressing with that. Because a lot of you are new, but many of you, uh, you are continuing to give and sacrifice and give so much to that project. So I want to give you some encouraging news. As of uh, last Sunday, uh, we had raised one million three hundred and forty. $9,654.40, everybody. Yeah, isn't that great news? So uh, if you're new to Journey, we never round up or round down because every single penny matters and every single person who's giving, it matters to them, right? And so just to give you a little bit like how are we tracking since we've moved in, so many new people are joining us along the journey to say, this is my home. I want to give to this. I want to be invested. In the past month, uh, people have given to the Build Projects $85,772.06, which is amazing in one month. Isn't that unbelievable? Yes. Thank you. And then um, we have remaining on our, our goal, $657,686.60. And then we have until March of 2019 to reach that goal. So I, I'm believing that we're going to far surpass that goal and believing that God is going to continue to uh, provide for us as a church. And the, the, the only thing I really want to say is just I'm so incredibly grateful. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for investing in this. And I know so many of you have continued to sacrifice and given over years to this church. So thank you for doing that. And honestly, God is blessing that. Uh, We're averaging a little over a thousand people per month here, uh, excuse me, per week, per Sunday here at Journey. So uh, in essence, we've been able to about double the size of our church since we've moved in here. So thank you for investing in that. It leads me to tell you a little bit about something that we do every year at Journey in Christmas time, like a year-end offering we call the legacy offering. And so on Sunday, December 10th, we'll begin to receive our year-end Christmas legacy offering. And our church, if you don't know, uh, the first dime of every dollar that is given to our church goes outside of our church. We give it away immediately uh, to the needs locally and around the world. We partner with a lot of churches to do church planning and missions, and so the first dime of every dollar goes outside. So well over $100,000 has been given away to our community and the world uh, in this calendar year. And then at the end of the year, we take a special emphasis and receive a special offering to collect even more to give away. And we have what we call our three legacy lanes. And what I mean by that is there's three primary areas that this offering goes to. Uh, and one is to Journey Church. Uh, when you, if you've ever moved into a new house, like built a new house and then moved in, you know it's, it's a little tight for a while. You know what I mean? Like you, you've got to save and scrimp and then you, you invest all you have into that. So the first part of this year, our board has challenged me and our leadership to make sure we're in the best place posture-wise for our church to continue to grow. So we'll take a little bit of that offering, put it toward that, and then we'll invest in local missions right here in South Denver and the Denver Metro area 
We'll be, we're vetting out some places that we'll just go and write a check to and bless them in the name of Jesus from Journey Church. And then we have several global initiatives like international mission projects that we're going to be investing in. We've been going to Haiti for, I think, four years now. And so we'll be continuing to partner with them and we're looking at a couple of other things. So I tell you this really early because I don't believe in high pressure giving. I, I, I don't think that, I, I, honestly, I think there's a place for spontaneous giving, but the scripture says each person should give as they have decided to give. So I want to give you several weeks to pray and ask God, what should we give in, in, in light of what you've given us, Lord, into this offering so that we can bless other people? So think about that and pray about it over the next few weeks. Uh, and then uh, one other really quick thing that I just want to mention and then we'll pray and jump into the message. I've got to, I want to introduce you to a couple of friends who are going to pray for our service this morning. Um, but we're really praying for the church in Sutherland, Texas. Uh, I mean, last Sunday, uh, you know, a, a lone gunman comes in and, and kills, I think, 26 people. Is that right? Uh, just horrific. And just praying for this sister church. Um, I can't even imagine what that's like for the pastor. And of course, you probably heard on the news that his daughter was one of the victims who was killed. And uh, just praying for them. We live in a broken world, and um, it's heartbreaking. Uh, but also, uh, as we're praying for them, I just want to acknowledge that you know every single week we have men and women in law enforcement who come here and serve at Journey. Many times you see the police officers here, you see the cars out front or downstairs, and they're checking in. And so they've been serving us since we moved to this uh, new location uh, regularly. Uh, and I just want you to say thank you to them when, when you see them. Yeah, so yeah thank you. Um, and... We, uh, we chatted with several uh, churches that were in kind of high visibility locations like we are, and they said, hey, this is a really good idea. And nothing's ever 100%, but it's a great deterrent when you pull into the parking lot and you see law enforcement there. And I just thank them for doing that. And uh, they're almost all school resource officers, so they know how to deal with large crowds and children. And, and so it's a great opportunity if you have kids to teach them. These are the good guys. They're helping to keep us safe. And, uh, and they really interact with a lot of our kids. They're in the pro into the kids' programs and those kinds of things. And so uh, anyway, I just want to say thank you to those guys and I uh, appreciate you understanding that. I want to introduce you to two people, Mike and Amy Spaulding. Can you guys come up onto the stage? You can bring your girls if they want to come. They don't. So come on up. No, they're like, no, no, we're not coming up there. Come on right this way. So I like to uh, introduce you from time to time to people who help lead our church. Uh, and this is Mike and Amy Spaulding, and they've been a part of our church for a long time. They're on our overseer team. And so I just asked them to share just a couple of brief words about themselves and maybe a prayer and a blessing for Journey and our offering. So, Mike, take it away, buddy. Thanks, Scotty. Um, this, I'm Mike, and this is my lovely bride, Amy. And those are girls Annabelle and Allison. And then we've got our little guy. He's sick downstairs, so Paige is holding him so we don't infect the rest of the church. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, we're, uh, we've been here in Colorado about five years and coming to journey just about that whole time, uh, originally from California, but we've lived all over the United States. Uh, my job has moved us around a bunch of places and we kind of like to say this is the final stop on the Spalding tour bus here in California or here in Colorado. Um, so, uh, hoping not to go back to California. Dude, uh, let's get that right. I mean, come on now. Seriously. That's right. So, Nobody. as you can see, we fly the right colors though. That's uh, right. So, Amen. So, uh, uh, lifelong Broncos fans, uh, you know, usually you can find us chasing these little girls or a little boy around. Uh, I'm running all over the bluffs over here, getting ready for something and working on our old house. So, uh, those are the things that we kind of are doing and, uh, other places you'll see us is back in the back serving uh, on the soundboard, on the computers, or greeting people, or maybe we're uh, teaching your little kids downstairs in the kindergarten or first grade room, Amy and I together. So we just so, feel so blessed to be a part of this church and a part of this family, and uh, I want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to serve. So I just got, uh, I'd love to say that I've been praying this for days and days and weeks and weeks, but I stumbled on it this morning. I thought it would be good to share. Yeah, really deep. I, that's me. Way to be prepared, Mike. That's Good right. job, buddy. Thanks. Uh, but uh, better late than never. So I just wanted to share this verse, and this is my prayer for us this morning. But it's in, uh, in Psalms 86, verse 11 through 13. It says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. 
I will glorify you, and I glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. And I just thank you, God, for the deliverance of each and every one of us, um, the deliverance from sin and your payment for our, our sins on the cross. And we just pray, God, that you would uh, just inspire us to have an undivided heart and uh, just chase after you really hard and, uh, and just serve one another um, in your name. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. I really Let's give them a hand. Thank you. I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, the men and women who are you know, leading our church, because a lot of you are new, and just seeing some of those faces, and these guys honestly spend countless hours behind the scenes praying for our church, and in meetings, helping to decide the direction and decisions for our church. They're just, I just love them, and I'm so blessed by them, and, and you are too, whether you know it or not. So, uh, we're going to jump into uh, a new series today. Uh, you know, I normally pray for the Broncos, but I've decided I think I'm going to start praying for the opposite team because nothing's working. It's not working. So, uh, but we're going to skip that today. So we're jumping into uh, a new series called Same Page. And what this series is about is what really matters. You know, it's really important to be on the same page in all kinds of areas of life. It's really important to be on the same page in your marriage, Right. If, you haven't, if you've been on a place when you weren't on the same page, that was really difficult. Uh, it's, it's really important to be on your same page in, in parenting. And we have the same viewpoint, what really matters. It's really important in your, in, in your office, right? Have you ever been on a team where it just felt like you just weren't headed in the same direction and it was just constant conflict and you really couldn't get accomplished what you wanted to? It's important to be on the same page in your communities, and uh, at schools, and all different kinds of areas, it's important to be on the same page because then you can win. Then you can accomplish something great and beautiful together when everyone's in agreement on that, especially in church. Uh, you know, you can be a part of the greatest symphony. Uh, you can have the, the greatest musicians, the best equipment, music stands, instruments. You can have a world-class conductor. But if you're not playing off the same sheet music, it's really ugly, right? Nobody, nothing beautiful is happening. We're not impressing anybody and entertaining anyone. It's all very confusing. Uh, you could be a part of a sports team. And imagine this, you, you break the huddle and no one knows where the goal line is. And so break the huddle and everybody runs in 11 different directions. You, you never win. And that's so frustrating and so confusing. I just grabbed this on the way out of the house this morning. My son uh, helped coach uh, the freshman football team at his high school. And this is a packet. And on the front, it says, uh, Valor Freshman Football 2017 Defensive Package. All right. So this is just the defensive playbook for the 14-year-old the boy football team. And so you just flip it open and, oh, we got hip or cutter versus pro. And if you're, you need to make sure you're in the strong B gap, key on the guard, slant strong B gap, zero plus tech. Anybody know what that means? Okay. But, but here, here's what I saw is this team, uh, by the way, this team was undefeated. And um, when 14 year old boys, when the play was called, all ran to where they were supposed to be and did what they were supposed to do. Why? Why? Because they were on the same page. Everybody, they repped it, they practiced it, they said, this is what's important, this is what I do, this is what really matters. So when you came in this morning, you received a bulletin. Inside that bulletin is a little outline you can take some notes on. You can have that posture of a learner, write some things down. It is easier to get into heaven if you write things down. And so go ahead and do that. And if you're not a note-taking kind of person, go ahead and do that anyway. Um, <laughs> So we're going to look at a, a couple of verses. We're just going to be in this series for two weeks, and here's what I'd like to do. Uh, today, I would like to talk about the Big C Church, and here's what I mean by that, like the capital C Church. Like There are some things that just really matter for the church everywhere. No matter where it is in the world, these things define what's really important for the church. And then next week, we're going to talk about maybe some of the unique things to journey. I really hope you come back, like some of the things that are really important to us, how we work on together the things that matter, uh, these kinds of things, but just do it in a unique uh, way to our culture and our church. But I want to begin 
with these verses out of Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Verses will be on the screen, uh, but they're also there on your outline or if you want to flip open in your Bible or your Bible app. And uh, these are some familiar verses if you've been around church for a while because we, we use them quite often as a model for what's really important in the church. In Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42, they're writing about the description of the beginning of the church. Uh, thousands of people have been added to the church. And now this is a description about what happens when they start to gather together. Uh, some people say, hey, I only like small churches. Well, you would have hated the church in the Bible because there are a lot of people who are coming to faith in Christ and responding to Jesus. But then they begin to gather, and these are the things that are important to them. Look at verse number 42. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And that's what we're focusing on today, is that we, we are a group of people who have something in common and that we're focused on something together. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved, daily those who were adjoining the movement of Jesus. So I want us to take a few notes today, walk through a couple of things where we're going to describe what it looks like to be a part of the church of Jesus really all over the world, the big ideas. Um, I was just with a, a global church leader on uh, Friday afternoon and Friday evening, had dinner with him. He's a bishop, which don't let that like mess you up. It just, the word bishop means overseer. He didn't have a big hat on or anything at dinner. He just, he oversees a large number of churches. And so he oversees some Western U.S. churches all the way into Asia. And he's telling me stories about, I just kept peppering him for stories about the global church, some of the things that he's seen um, in China and in India and in places where it, you wouldn't think the church would be growing very rapidly, but is exploding. Like, Dozens into hundreds into thousands of churches being planted in secret. And many, many people are coming to faith in Christ. And honestly, giving way more than we ever imagined here in the Western U.S. to, make, to see that happen. He was telling me the story about an, an Indian pastor who went into a village, into a very a strict Hindu village, and was beaten severely. This just happened last year. Just beaten severely, uh, tied to a tree, and then poured gasoline on his legs and set him on fire. I mean, this was last year as a part of the network of churches that we're a part of. So, like, just let's rewind one second. When, when we give money, like as a church, you bucket comes by, you put it in there. Like, that's what it's going to. Like when we give outside of this, like money went to this pastoral church planting movement in India of which you're supporting the recovery of this pastor who's trying to plant the church in India and facing severe persecution. And then this just completely blows my mind. After he recovers, goes back to the same village, shares the gospel and starts a church there. Like, you know, that would just be like my white flag of surrender, you know, like gasoline. You know, if it if it snows a half an inch, half the church doesn't come. Right. I mean, and I'm not like judging anybody. Most Sunday mornings I wake up and go, man, I'm tired. I roll over to Amy and go, you think I need to go today? And she's like, yeah, you need to go today. <laughs> like I get, you know, I understand. I'm not like on the stage. Like, look, I, I, when I hear that story, I think, God. Are you serious? The global church is exploding around the world. In every pocket and corner and language, the church of Jesus is marching forward and doing amazing things. And there are a few things that, that they really concentrate on. And so we want to be a part of that too. And I want you to, to write this down. We are that church. We're a little bitty piece of the big C capital church. Like we're, we're a little expression of of the billions of people that Jesus is at work. We're that church, but we're also that church. Oh, you're that church. Yes, we really believe some things. We're not in the mushy middle here at Journey. Like There's some things that we just absolutely believe. 
And here's what we call them. We, we call them the closed hand. Like these things aren't up for debate. Like we will stand on these things. Like till the end, this is who we are. There's a lot of open-handed things like we can debate and we can discuss. Sometimes I think we would have to teach Jesus a lot of the things that we do in church. Do you know what I mean? We would have to teach him about boards and deacons and, you know, how we organize. Hey, G and I don't really mean we'd have to teach Jesus because he knows everything, right? So I don't mean like, well, Jesus, let me explain this to you. I just mean a lot of what we do as a cultural church is very different than what you see in the Bible. And so a lot of things are open for discussion, but there's some things that just, they, that's what we hold on to. That's the rock that we stand on. So let me just walk through a couple of things today. One is this. This is always preeminent and most important, and that is that Jesus is the lead story. We are not gathered here for a social club. We're not even gathered here so that you could have better life principles. When we talk about inviting people, we're not really talking about inviting them to church. We want them to meet Jesus. Because Jesus is the preeminent one. Jesus is the one who is making the way for us to have new and fresh life and have a relationship with God. Look at this verse together with me. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the lead story. We, more than anything else, want to be associated and called a Jesus church. We are a group of people who want to lift high and exalt the Son of God. He is the one who is making the incredible difference in our lives. Number two is this. All over the world, the global church, uh, the scripture is our standard. The Bible, we believe, is true and accurate and powerful, and able to change the lives of people. At Journey, and in churches growing all over the world, the scripture is our standard. We say it's the only book that the author is always present when it's being read. It's a unique uh, in its collection. It's 40, uh, excuse me, 66 books, 40 different authors, written over a period of about 1,500 years, on three different continents, yet it has this one consistent theme, that theme is that Jesus is the lead story and that he is rescuing and redeeming a people and drawing them back to God. And so the scripture will always be our filter. It will always be our standard. It is what we will go back to to make decisions. Uh, here's some important information is that many of you, you may say, yes, I believe that. I've, I've explored. I know. I have faith. I stand with that. I believe the word of God. But you don't have to believe that to belong here. There are many people who would stand here and say, I'm just not sure exactly where I am with that. That's okay too. That's part of the story of journey. But what you need to know is that your pastors and the leaders of, of this church will always go back to the scripture as our standard. Meaning that when we come and we try to make decisions together as a church or move forward together as a church or head in this direction or that direction, we're always going to be asking, what does God's word say? We all have opinions. We all have feelings. Uh, but we don't base our church and our direction and our decisions based off our opinions or our feelings. One of the first things that we'll ask is, well, what does the Bible have to say about that? What does the scripture have to say about that? Because I don't know about you, but I change feelings like I change underwear just about every day. <laughs> Hopefully every day, babe. <laughs> she gave me the, you better change it every day. But we want to stand on something. I think our world is so desperate for something that says there's certainty in that. I will lean into that. I will trust that, that the principles in the heart of the scripture matter. Look at this verse together. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says this, all scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture is breathed from the mouth of, the mouth of God for his for his children to be able to know what is good and right and true and to walk in it. Third, is that we as a church and all over the world, we live by radical and practical grace. The story of the gospel, and the, the word gospel means good news if you don't know. It's a 
It's a Roman term, Greek term. It means to announce something that is good. The story of the gospel is not that we were simply bad people or that we just couldn't get it all together, weren't just really morally where we needed to be. It's that we were spiritually dead and Jesus has made us alive. And we live by this radical grace that God has bestowed and given to us by the death of Christ on the cross. Look at this verse together in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, or you have come into a relationship with God through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. I didn't do enough good things to earn this. God bestowed this grace on me. We are God's handiwork created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, God, every religion in the history of man has always been defined by two letters, do. What can I do to reclaim a relationship with God? And Christianity stands distinct and different by saying it's about what Jesus has done for you. That he has stood in your place for your sins. And that's radical. And we also use this word practical. Because once we have received grace from God, it is upon us to now give that. So the church of Jesus has its doors wide open to whoever, whenever, to say, you can come and be a part of our family. You can come and step in and be part of our church. No matter what you've done, where you've been, who you are, how you've fallen apart, you are welcomed here. Why? Because there's no competition about who can do it better. Because none of us did it well. The ground at the cross is even. It's flat. And we all stand level before the Son of God. And now that we have been given that grace, we give it out in really practical ways. And we use this word practical because if you've ever had to give grace to someone, it is incredibly difficult. If you've ever had to forgive your spouse for something that they hurt you deeply with, If you've ever had to look at a friend who betrayed you and and bless them instead of curse them, it's hard. If you've ever had to like decide like who gets to be a part of the church, like they screwed up six or seven years ago, can they now lead? Like those are messy decisions. But as a church, we're constantly saying is as long as you're not dead, God's not done with you. And we're going to give you practical grace. In other words, we're going to help you be restored. Um, We offer as the church of Jesus, extravagant worship. All over the world, whether you're in Kiev or a hut or meeting secretly or in a cathedral in Europe, the people of Jesus offer extravagant worship. And somewhere along the way, we, we connected worship with music. And that's great. I love music. I love to sing. I love worship music. I'm a horrible singer, but I will sing out loud. If you see me driving down the road, I'm going after it, just singing, thinking I sound good. Do you think you sound good? Have you ever had that moment when you're singing, either in the shower or driving down the road, and you're like, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I think, I think, and then, like, then someone's with you, and they, you're just giving, it, and they're like, that's awful. Like, your children will tell you the truth. That is awful. Don't ever do that, Dad. That's awful. So uh, we've connected worship with singing, and it is, but it's way more than that. It is a response to the radical grace that we have received. And therefore, it's not just about a song, it's about our whole life. Worship is not what we do, it's why we do it. So look at this verse together, uh, Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. In other words, I offer all of me because, Jesus, you gave all of yourself for me. And worship is a response to that grace. I want to show you just a two-minute video of something I experienced several years ago in 2009. Would you turn your attention to the screens? We're going to click on play in just a second, but let me set it up. Uh, This young man uh, was raised in Africa and was sponsored as a compassion child 
Um, and so he begins to tell the story of what happened to him. And you know, do you understand Compassion Children, where people will sponsor a child and give money each month to make sure that they have the basic needs that they have, and then they will write letters to them and you know, try to get to know them. And so the young man who started giving to this other young man, he, his, his name was Mark, and I believe the, the man who was receiving the, the aid through the Compassion, his name was Jimmy and living in Africa. I think he started when he was about six years old, four or six years old, and now he's a grown man telling some of that story. So let's turn the attention to the screens and watch just this two-minute quick little video. Because from then, my life is a different life. I'm at Moody Bible Institute right now, studying the Bible to go back to Kenya. <laughs> to go back to Kenya and stand in the gap, in the same way Mark Hells from Canada stood in the gap for me. My mother died six years later after the sponsorship. It is the same time I got saved and knew what my sponsor meant when he said there's a real good friend in Jesus Christ. Right now, I'm sponsoring a kid in Haiti. She's four years old. That's the time that I was intervened at, and I think that's the time that I need to intervene to a child and change the whole cause of their life. I am so grateful that Compassion and through the ministry that they have across the world has changed my life and who I am. I'm ready to stand in the gap for many others who just need somebody to stand in the gap for them. Isn't that great? Here's a young man whose life was changed by the love of Christ being put in action through a young 20-year-old, and now he's standing in the gap and helping others. One question, have you ever talked to your sponsor? No. You have not? No. Well, would you like to meet him right now? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mark Hales, Jimmy's sponsor. So that is extravagant worship. It's a response to great generosity and giving. Um, I mean, I was sitting there with, uh, is Luke in here? Luke was with me, a couple other guys. We're sitting maybe six or eight rows up. Uh, We will be forever marked by that moment. Um, Because, I mean, it was obviously a surprise. Um, And, I mean, they're not dry in the place. Uh, because this kid started giving, I think he was like a 19-year-old college student, gave like 20 years, and then he, he bumps into the kid that he's giving, and, and that guy just responds, right? He, that, 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 it wasn't like, you know what I'm going to think about? I'm going to think about whether or not I'm going to cry here or what. He just responded, and it, I cut it off, but he, he gets so emotional, he has to like sit down. Um, because he was so grateful for the grace that had been given to him. And you already heard what he was talking about, right? Here he, he's sponsoring now kids in Haiti. He's going back to school, all that, all because the love of Christ was at work, this radical grace, giving away. And so what else would we do as the church but give all we have for the next person who needs grace, right? That's... That's what the church of Jesus does. God has given me this, something I could never repay, something I can't even fathom. I'm overwhelmed by it, and now I give. Yeah, I sing. Yeah, I might raise a hand. Yeah, I might get emotional and cry. But the greatest act of worship is giving away that grace to somebody else. That's the church of Jesus. A couple more that we'll fly through here is that we are family. The church around the world is not an organization that you join It's a family you belong to. 
after the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and into Acts, in those books, they use these kinds of words, disciple, rabbi, you know, become... And then it moved into a Greek culture where they didn't have like words that would represent that. And so they started using family language, brothers and sisters, spiritual fathers and mothers. You are joining a family. Look at this verse together, Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers. You're citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We are sons and daughters of a good, good father. And so when we come together, and even in a room this size, there's a lot of people in here. There will be people that you are family with, with people who are brothers and sisters. And guess what? Families are crazy. <laughs> Did you know that? Is yours? Does everybody have like a little, little bit of nut job going on in your family? Well, so does the church of Jesus. So when you come in, you go, I just don't know if I like all this. There's stuff going on. Remember, it's a family and families are crazy. They're dysfunctional. But if we're trying to follow Jesus together, we're going to work it out. We're going to sit down and talk about it. We're going to use the scripture as our standard, not just how I feel, but how should I respond? This is so important. Listen, we can't live the way of Jesus alone. You can't get isolated. You can worship God by yourself. I've heard that so many times. I love to worship God in the mountains. You can, but you can't live the way of Jesus by yourself. Why? Because you need brothers and sisters to encourage you, challenge you, and you do the same for them. Last one today is that we are urgent in purpose. The church of Jesus is urgent in purpose, meaning that uh, we see that people's lives are fainting, that the world is broken and that things are uh, quickly becoming darker and the church must be responsible for stepping into the hard places and the dark places and helping people discover and meet Jesus. Look at this verse. Most of you are familiar with it. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the last words of Jesus before he ascends to heaven. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go make learners. Go help people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And then surely I will be with you always to the end of the age. Meaning as you do this, I will be with you. So just a couple of ideas to close with this of why we're so urgent in purpose. And that's because the church exists for those who aren't there yet. It's the only organization in the world that exists for people who aren't its members. Like we exist for the people who aren't here yet. And so that's why we built a new house and that's why we invite and that's why we have conversations because we exist for people who haven't yet found the grace that we might have found. Listen, this is so important. It's so true. Is that everyone spends eternity somewhere. Remember, our standard is the scripture. And the Bible says that everyone spends eternity either with Jesus or separated from Jesus. That's a hard truth in our culture, but it is true. And so we want people to meet Jesus in their life. And that's why we are a sent people. We gather here to be inspired and encouraged, but then we scatter to be sent to the world to live out the message and mission of Jesus wherever we are. And churches all over the world are doing this. And we just get to be a, a, little, a little part of it. And next week, uh, we're going to talk about how does that uniquely play out here at Journey. Let's pray together. So, Lord, uh, we're so grateful. I'm going to ask the band to come as we're praying. and uh, We're so grateful for just that picture of that young man and his response to grace. Um, that you have done that same thing for us on a scale we can't even imagine. And so, Jesus is our hero. He is the lead story. It's told about in the scriptures. This radical grace that we have received. And now, we respond with our lives. Maybe today you're here in the room and you think, if that's what God is like, like giving to me like that, um, I I really want to start following Jesus. I don't have all my questions answered. I don't know how it all fits and works together. But if that's what Jesus is like, I want to begin. I want to start. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. We don't want to miss this moment because maybe right now God's knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, hey, come follow me. And you need to take that first step today. So if that's you, why don't you pray a simple prayer like this, something like this. 
Jesus, I, I, I really believe in you and I, I want to follow you. I don't have all my questions answered yet, but I trust you. And I believe that you live for me and that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the grave. I, I believe that and I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sin, all the things I've done wrong, and help me to begin my journey. Now, without anybody looking around, I would never embarrass you or call on you in any way, but I would like to pray for you today. If you just prayed that prayer and taking your first step, would you just raise your hand up real high so I can pray for you? Nobody else is going to be looking. Yes, sir. Who else? Yes, sir. Who else? Lord, thank you for the two or three people here who said, you know what, I'm ready. I'm going to step into that. I pray you'll help them, God, meet them there. For the rest of us, God, as we try to be the church in South Denver, that we would remember that you are amazing and that we would give radical and practical grace to people because we've received it as a family and being urgent in that. In Jesus' name, amen.